If you're below the age of 30 and you spend any time on young book TikTok at any point, eventually you're going to stumble across a book called A Little Life. Now, I am not as avid of a reader as I am into movies and TV shows. Uh, however, there is something about this book's reputation that precedes it. It reminds me of these sort of big confrontational shocking movies you hear about every couple of years where, where people kind of stand on either side of the spectrum on whether you should adore it or hate it, whether it should be championed or banned. It, it brings to mind maybe movies from like Lars von Trier, such as Nymphomaniac and Antichrist, as well as a show like 13 Reasons Why. Now, I think this book is far more dignified than something like 13 Reasons Why. There's a sort of weird level of controversy coming from people my age and younger surrounding this book. I need the book talk bitches to stop hyping up this motherfucking book because I read it last year and I can tell you there's nothing to gain or to absorb or to learn from this fucking book. Your time would be better spent doing some self-reflection, bitch, because this book will give you nothing but sadness, depression, and mental illness. There are not enough trigger warnings in the world to encompass what the fuck goes on in here. Don't read it. Don't read it. I haven't cried yet because I'm just pissed off. Like, this isn't... What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck is this, guys? <laughs> Why would you write this? Why would you write this book? I was stunned initially when I first started reading it to find out that it was also incredibly critically acclaimed. Uh, this won the Booker Prize. This book is also seemingly a staple of modern literature. I think it's interesting because it shows this generational sort of divide. It feels like critics and people a lot older than I am are just sort of looking at it as, I'm sure it's great, can I handle it, yes or no? Whereas people younger have serious uh, moral objections against the book. <laughs> You hear about all this controversy, all its graphic content, and it drives you to want to read it. This book single-handedly got me out of a 10, 12 year reading slump, which I hesitate to even call a reading slump, I just wasn't reading. I found it totally gripping, I found it troubling, I found it frustrating, I found it momentarily fantastic and momentarily embarrassing. The one thing that can be said about this book is there is definitely stuff to talk about. On top of that, it is now in movie theaters and Broadway theaters. There is a movie version of the Broadway play of A Little Life. And I saw it and I have thoughts on that too. So I, I just want this video to be sort of a book club type experience, I guess. I just want people to be able to come here who have read the book or seen the movie and just have some interesting thoughts, one person to another about this book. Now I'm going to talk about a lot of the graphic content in this book. I'm gonna have some opinions that might uh, polarize people. Uh, I guess I just ask for patience here. I don't think it's going to be particularly easy to navigate the book, its contents, as well as the real life ramifications, as well as the author's comments without maybe saying one or two things that doesn't fly over well with every single viewer. I just think this book, its reception, its adaptation, uh, its author are all just so incredibly fascinating and I think it's worth a serious and dignified discussion. I think uh, it, it feels like the online discourse recently quickly ran away into just I hate this book or I hate the people that hate this book. And I think the answer, like a lot of things, is somewhere in between. Basically, the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to go through pretty much everything I can. I just have a series of bullet points and thoughts and notes. Uh, I'm not going to do a point A to point B recap. This video is not meant to serve as a recap or a spoiler run through of everything that happens in the plot. I'm assuming you've read the book or seen the movie, or at the very least, if you wanna watch this video, read a sort of recap or summary of the book's events. You might be able to keep up. I'm going to go through a bunch of things that happen in the book quite in depth. I'm not going to be holding your hand through it. Uh, I'm assuming you've read it and I'm assuming that you're aware of the content. Secondly, really the way I'm just going to do this is I'm going to go through a bunch of interesting talking points and thoughts I have about the book, have about the adaptation. Hopefully this just serves as sort of supplementary material that feels really well-rounded and just like an interesting discussion about the book. I'm gonna come. First off, let's ju let's just start on the external. I love the front cover of this book. Now, the one with Lispinard Street, where it's in the title, average cover, whatever, it's fine. The uh, the cover of the orgasmic man photo 
is wild. I love it. I love it. it. It reminds me of the set of Nymphomaniac posters where it's just all the actors basically mid getting their cummies. It's great. And I think the thing I love about the use of this orgasmic man photo, for some people, they, they don't pick up on what it is. When I first saw that photo, knowing that this book has been hailed as the great gay novel, uh, I looked at the cover and went, that's a dude busting a nut. And um, it's interesting because then a lot of people I've shown the book to don't realize that because also the book's reputation is that it is sad. A lot of people think it's a photo of someone sort of like, I guess, having a great uh, emotionally torturous realization. The thing is though, is that sort of misreading, that sort of, is this a happy moment or a sad moment, is the dichotomy that Hanya, the author, wanted to actually evoke. She talks about in an interview how the reason this photo was chosen is because you can't tell if he's experiencing great pleasure or great pain. I saw this image, a friend of mine reminded me of it when we were looking for cover images, and I thought it was so, I'm looking at it here, which is why I keep looking down, but I thought it was so wonderful because I thought, A, you couldn't tell whether he was in pleasure or in pain, but you knew that you were trespassing on a very vulnerable moment for someone, and it was unbearable to look at. And I hope that it echoes the experience of reading the book as well, that you are violating someone's most intimate moment. Um, and in that sense, um, I, I thought it was the right cover. Given the contents of the book and the fact that the main character is someone who is completely sexually traumatized and also can't engage in joyous sex by the end of the book, it's a really tragic, painful, almost twist of the knife to have this be the front cover. And that's 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 the start of this book discussion, just the front cover already. You're like, Jesus. The poster for the movie, the poster for the play, I despise. Uh, I think it's totally misleading. I think it, it totally spits in the face of what makes the book cover great, which is just this striking, polarizing, confrontational almost sort of cover where you're like, I'm disturbed, I'm off put, and I'm perplexed. I might read this. Uh, the poster for the movie, looks like it's gonna be like a fun sort of time, uh, especially paired with the title. I think the book cover works great because it's a striking haunting image with a title that could be misinterpreted as something happy. But when you look at the movie poster, uh, you get why a bunch of people are going into this movie and then an hour or so into it, uh, leaving because they've been totally misled. Uh, it's a really, really weird cover. On top of that, I feel like the whole presentation of the marketing material for the play version, for the movie version, as well as the trailer, is full of like schmaltzy music. and schmaltzy visuals to almost, it feels, trick people into seeing something that's meant to be life-affirming and beautiful. I know that some people have read the book and describe it as beautiful and moving, but uh, look, I think it is a bleak, bleak piece of work. I think the marketing seems to be almost sugarcoating and trying to reframe the public perception of just how tough of a monster this book is. Because you, you sit down in the movie and aside from maybe one or two moments, it is just wallowing and just harrowing. Saying that, there are some really gorgeous moments and I'll get into that, but a lot of it is just witnessing trauma and torture. While there are moments of levity, for example, the gay relationship that is kind of explored later in the book, even that is just soaked in painful sexual dynamics and mutual trauma. I love the title of the book. I love the name drops. Uh, if you've read the book, uh, you know that there are sort of two name drops of the title that are just completely harrowing. You're, you're sort of hoping that the context for what a little life is used is sort of the idea that despite all this trauma, he has a nice little life that he enjoys, but it's, it's really not that. The first time I believe the title is name dropped is when main character Jude is completely beat up and abused by a abusive partner called Caleb. He is then thrown out into the street naked and then thrown down the stairs. And I believe while he's reflecting on the fact that his sort of safe space, his apartment has been invaded, he talks about the fact that he built a little life for himself and has been completely sort of turned upside down and invaded. Uh, a tragic first use, but nothing can prepare you for the way it is later used in the book. Uh, that is basically when a monk from a monastery is essentially pimping out a young child Jude and soliciting him to others, essentially selling him into sex trafficking. 
He then gives a speech to Jude and says, you know, when you're with these clients, uh, they're paying for an experience and you need to show a little life. When the title is finally dropped in that context by Brother Luke, the floor falls from under you because you realize, okay, this book probably isn't interested in redemption. It isn't a book that is interested in finding hope or a silver lining. This is a book that wants you to sit in the pain and, and feel this pain throughout its runtime. Next, uh, the experience of this story as a book is kind of incredibly immersive. Again, I'm not a super avid reader. I've only read like four books this year. I remember I really enjoyed reading A Little Life because I thought its use of language was fantastic. I also thought that its pacing at points was actually kind of a masterstroke, especially rereading it. Uh, I really respected how patient it was at the start and then just how much it ramped up towards the end. I, I, I think a lesser author would have given the reader just total total whiplash. I actually really do admire sort of the compelling mystery of what Jude's backstory actually is and then finding that out in just excruciating detail relentlessly in the last half. You almost go, did I want to actually find this out? Maybe not this way, maybe this relentlessly is too much. Really successfully puts you in the place of someone like Willem who has to find all this out in one big go. It's a torturous and painful experience and I think she needs to be commended for how she pulls this off. However, in saying that, I also do wonder if the fact that this book's reputation precedes it is what kept me going. Would I have stuck around the initial 100, 200 pages that can feel meandering at points, can feel sort of excruciatingly slow and over-explained for things that later don't really matter? Would I have stuck the book's initial slow pacing if I didn't sort of have this weird preconceived promise from the book's previous audience that it just gets relentlessly interesting and also relentlessly fucked up. And I think that's sort of an unspoken component of this book and one that's been summarized by a great YouTuber that I'll mention here. The, the idea that this book needs to be shared with someone. You read this book, you finish this book and you need to talk about it with people. And not even in the way of like, oh my God, this book messed me up so much. I, I need to go to therapy or I need, a, I need support from my friends. But almost just this thing of if you don't talk about the book with someone, it, it just feels like this thing you have to carry. It almost feels like a subject that you've been studying for ages. And it's like, well, what do I do with all this information now? It, it almost reminds you of when a friendship or a relationship ends and you know all this stuff about a person and you're like, I guess that just sits in my brain now. You get such an interesting in-depth look into who Jude is as a character. You know so much about him. You know so much about his life from birth to death pretty much that by the time you're done with the book, yeah, you need to talk about it with someone. It needs to be shared. On top of that, the subject matter itself is worth discussing. There are thought-provoking chunks and chapters in this book that reckon with ideas that are incredibly confrontational and spit in the face of a lot of discourse that we have nowadays. So as a book, as a read, it is completely compelling. She, she does an incredible job of essentially creating a visual portrait out of words. This is as close to a movie I've ever felt a book feel. I feel like I can picture these apartments. I can picture these characters for the most part. I think that's wonderful. Hey you, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. Anya has said in an interview that she set out with this book to explore a character that does not get better, that does not go on a hero's journey, that sort of stays in one place from the start of the book till the end of the book. The more interesting idea she followed this up with was the idea of whether she could create narrative tension in a character that is essentially doomed and cannot get better and cannot be redeemed. So I wanted to create a character who never got better. And that one of the things I wanted to do textually was see what kind of suspense and tension could be made in a book in which the redemption narrative never gets fulfilled. You know, we're used to our characters, not only in books, but in movies and in any sort of art and in life, I think, um, beginning at here and ending here. So I thought, well, what would it be like to write a character who, who doesn't ever really improve? And can you still find narrative tension? And can you still find a sense of momentum in that kind of story? Look, that's an incredibly eloquent way of putting it. And when you hear that as a sort of premise and a hook for a book, it is innately compelling. Uh, that idea is fundamentally interesting. And the way she's worded it, pretentious or not, makes you go, fuck yeah, I want to take that gamble. And the thing is, she 100% pulls it off. This book is fascinating. You are constantly waiting for the shoe to drop to find out what actually happened to Drew, to find out all the answers 
that you do want to know kind of from the moment you start the book. However, this comes with a massive asterisk. And I guess my question is, and I'm not sure if many other readers will agree, is this a case of knowing where the book goes, going into it, that's where the tension comes from. I wonder if I just picked up the book, whether I would have been as compelled to finish it as quickly as I did if I wasn't sort of promised that this is apparently the most fucked up book you can read. And now that's me admitting that I guess I find this sort of subject matter and content interesting. There's a certain level of shame and stigma that comes with admitting that you find this stuff interesting, but at the same time, this book is a bestseller. It went completely viral. And I would prefer if the general discourse was just kind of acknowledged that yeah, living in someone else's pain and experiencing these harrowing events in sort of this voyeuristic way is fascinating. Whether you agree with it morally or not is another discussion. I think a lot of people are sort of too scared to admit that this is just fundamentally interesting. And it's interesting because of how dark it is. Uh, you want to kind of know just how far Hanya will test you, how far she will push these characters and what she's willing to explore. And as you're reading it, it is like a car crash that you need to look away from, but you can't. I, I would be lying if I didn't tell you that when you actually start getting the Brother Luke stories and you get the section with the FBI as well as just what was being done to Jude, uh, I was locked in. You know, I paused whatever background task I was doing for the rest of the book and sat there and just listened to it. And yeah, that's me acknowledging that there is a weird, perverse level of entertainment that comes from a book this dark. The online discourse seems to sort of skip this part, especially the fact that the first time this book sort of went viral was during COVID, where I feel like uh, everyone was sort of lost, sitting at home and just wanted to feel something that wasn't boredom. Uh, a book like this that is as long as it is and feels like you can just witness a life of suffering probably feels like a weird, weird sense of escapism for some people. Do I think she pulled off her kind of mission statement of making a character like that compelling? Yes. But I also think I was drawn to the book due to its controversial reputation. And I'm wondering how much that edged me along and how much good grace that gave me going into the book. I do think, however, if this book was told chronologically, it wouldn't be compelling. The only reason she sort of achieves this narrative tension and this drive to finish the book is the fact that she intentionally withholds what Jude's backstory is hints at it throughout until finally you get to find out just what happened to him. And as silly as it sounds, because obviously the book isn't presented chronologically, I just feel like if it was, uh, you would basically have a really interesting first half and then just a really kind of drawn out, painful slog to what feels like a totally inevitable conclusion. Jude's fate is one that you can basically predict very early on, given the book's reputation as well as the self-harm subjects it's exploring. It is not a surprise that Jude chooses to do what he does at the end of the book. And, and you also get the feeling very early on that he is not going to get better. I, I think Hanya in her interview when she says, I want to explore the narrative tension of a character that doesn't get better is a really good idea. However, it feels like Jude never really tries or wants to get better. And I'm not discounting the level of pain and trauma that Jude is in. And obviously he is a very accomplished person. He has become an enigmatic lawyer. He can sing, he can cook, he has great friends. He's incredibly intelligent. His inner monologue throughout the book is one that is pretty much completely completely deprived of any sense of hope or longing to get better. It is just longing for the pain to stop from the moment the book starts. In that sense, the tension only comes in sort of fleeting moments. Maybe when Harold adopts him and he's happy for a bit, or maybe when Willem and him start a sexual and romantic relationship and you're almost hoping that they can make it work. However, aside from that, when eventually he succumbs to his own mental illness and does what he does, you're sort of seeing that going, well, minus a few emotionally high detours, I assume this is where it was going. Given his demeanor, given just the way he talks about himself and as well as the world, and it's tragic and it's painful to watch, there's this great sense of despair that is really well put when he's grieving the loss of Willem. However, while he was with Willem, I never really got a sense that he was actually genuinely happy. It felt like he was still incredibly defined by his trauma. 
And obviously that's fine. I'm not condemning him for that. It felt like his response to losing Willem and what an emotional toll that took wasn't exactly indicative of how he felt during that relationship. At least when I read the book, it felt to me that he wanted to please Willem. He wanted to be good for Willem. He wanted them to have a good relationship, but it felt like something that felt like a life of quiet desperation. Especially those sections where he talked about the idea of wanting to basically sexually perform and please Willem. Uh, but not being able to do that due to his own sexual traumas. And even though how what Willem and him are engaging in is consensual, it still feels like a harrowing, traumatic experience. These are ideas that are explored in such great depth and you get such a sort of vicarious feeling of anxiety for Jude in these moments. Uh, for me particularly, I almost found these sections more harrowing than some of the early childhood just due to the fact that in Jude's current state, you're hearing the emotional turmoil of how he wants to make someone happy and how he just can't do it. And it almost feels like because he has a choice in the matter, it's worse. It's why the incredibly messed up quote of the great thing about being an adult is you get to say no to sex. That quote hits like an absolute truck because you see in the book and the play for at least a really good chunk, how much of a consent king and how thoughtful and caring Willem is at the start of their relationship. Despite that, Jude Jude's own mental pain leads him to viewing a sexual consensual relationship with this much pain. As a result, when Willem passed away, it, it just felt like a harrowing chapter that has now closed rather than the most important thing in Jude's life leaving. That's just me. Maybe I'm like totally. Now, I just want to touch on the movie here for a bit because there are a lot of things that were left out and some of it I think was a great choice to leave out. The book is sort of pitched and I think it's almost mismarketed as a, a book about four friends that are going through life and they're all unified by Jude and they are all undone when they find out his secrets. That's basically how it's pitched to me. That's sort of what the blurb is. When you read the book, this is true for about 100 or 200 pages and then all of a sudden it is just about Jude. It, it just becomes about Jude and that's fine. Uh, that's actually great and I think Jude is an incredibly compelling character so I have no issue there. I just feel like the blurb's a bit misleading and I feel like the amount of time that is spent on the characters early on to completely forget about it almost feels wasted. I saw someone defending this book saying that not every single character needs a concrete and solved arc. Some characters just come in to serve a purpose and then leave and I completely agree. I completely agree. I do not need every single one of these characters to have completely fleshed out and well-written arcs. Uh, they are side characters. But I think the thing is, when we initially start the book, so much time is spent on these other characters that they all feel like for a good chunk, for maybe a tenth or an eighth of the book, this is a story with four or three main characters. And then all of a sudden, it is just the Jude show. And it makes you question why so much time was spent on these other characters in general. Now, yes, you could argue that later on when someone like JB comes back into Jude's life and taunts him or insults him or causes him turmoil, you're meant to then refer back to the early sections of the book and have that be informed. However, I don't think the book pulls this off particularly well and I can't help but feel like by the end of the book when it started focusing again on other friends, I sort of had a feeling of, well, where the fuck have they been this whole time and why do I care at this point? Get back to Jude and his trauma. I, I think this issue is actually sort of rectified a bit in the play. Now, this this whiplash still happens. There, it, it still opens as a story about four friends and then deviates into just the Jude show for 80% of it. However, I felt like in the play, uh, the pacing was a lot tighter. It's a four hour play rather than a 30 hour audio book or an 800 page book. And I think the play slash movies pacing uh, benefits the relationships of these core characters. You get a really good insight. Uh, JB feels like a main character and he feels like an all seen prophet amongst the friendship group for a really good chunk in this movie. Now he still leaves and I still miss his presence. This sort of loss of the friendship group doesn't feel as present. It just feels like you've gone 10, 20 minutes without seeing some of them. And yeah, I just think it's better done. I think you get the sense of friendship and that it's these friends popping in and out of each other's lives a bit better better, in my opinion. There are also things in the theater, the play, the movie experience of this book that I think 
you can't get in the book. And I think the book is retroactively going to be strengthened by this movie version. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. It is a very common belief that the Harry Potter books are better than the movies. And yes, if you read the books, there is way more subtext, there is way more context. There is, there is so much more to get from those books than those movies. However, I think the books are also strengthened by how good the movies are and by how good the actors portrayals are. I, I remember I read the first three books back in high school and the whole time, whenever I pictured any character, I was picturing Daniel Radcliffe or Alan Rickman or Emma Watson as Hermione as these characters. And I was thinking of their portrayal and their vocal intonations. And I found it strengthened the book reading experience for me. I was, I was instantly more compelled. So yes, Obviously, you get more from these books, but I also think it can go both ways. They can inform each other. I, I think the easy answer here for A Little Life is the book is better, there's more. However, I think there are actually serious, serious advantages that this movie version has. First off, the pacing is great for the most part. Now, there are some things that feel rushed. However, there are things that felt rushed in the book. The abusive partner, Caleb, feels very rushed in this movie. However, it felt very rushed in the book. And in the book, I had more of an issue of it feeling rushed because we spent so much time on useless shit in the book. Sorry, uh, hot take, but there was so much time spent on just total non sequiturs, stuff about characters' careers that never comes up again, that then when you get to Caleb, the abusive ex-partner, and it's handled in like a chapter, even though it's meant to be a whole relationship, uh, it, it just gives you total whiplash and it feels incredibly rushed and incredibly underwritten. However, in the movie, even though it does feel quite quick, uh, it feels consistent with the pacing of the rest of the play. The play, due to it being four hours, is very quick and moves through a lot very, very, very fast. And I found that as a result, it felt like a series of memories that we were experiencing non-chronologically. And as a result, this felt like just a brief flashback. Whereas in the book, moments where it felt rushed were really frustrating. It's like you had 800 pages, you had 30 hours of an audio book and something that feels really important, feels like a really good opportunity to look at how ableist and abusive uh, and homophobic partners can be, uh, just feels completely, completely rushed. In the movie, you're far more forgiving of the pacing because they have a lot to get through and they have a lot to get through fast. You can't help but feel like due to the play format that it is sort of working within limitations. It's kind of exciting to watch how they actually get through these limitations. Uh, another fascinating thing is not only are you watching a play, but you are watching a movie version of a play. And I found myself constantly struck by what we get to see. I think this movie is probably a better experience than seeing the Broadway play live. You get hard cuts, like this close, uh, facial zooms and camera angles. Uh, you get top down bird's eye view sections of Jude's body. These are things that if you paid $200 for a ticket, you would not be able to see. I think as a movie of a play, this is fantastic. I was completely, completely relieved. I was so nervous about how this was gonna go, whether I was gonna be trapped in a seat for four hours, not engaged with any of the characters, thinking that the filming was clunky and I couldn't hear anything. This feels like a movie. Yes, there is a live audience in the background you can see, but it feels like a movie. The best I can compare it to is Lars von Trier again, but the movie he did Dogville, where basically it is a movie, but there are no sets. You have to fill them in. It's almost like a reading. Incredibly fascinating movie, by the way. Definitely watch it. Uh, this was incredibly impressive. I could not believe how good the pacing was. And I also could not believe how good the actors were and also conveying changes in scenery and location. I was... I was talking about this movie with my boss, trying to explain just how well they did it, and I couldn't do it. He was like, well, how did they handle the sex scenes? How did they handle this? I'm like, oh, you know, they had uh, all their clothes on for one of the sex scenes or one of the assault scenes. And um, yeah, it was just as haunting as I feel like it could have been in an actual movie. And he was like, really? I'm like, yeah, you kind of have to see it though. Like you have to see it. The book explores uh, really severe levels of self-harm and mutilation. And uh, the play, yes, isn't as graphic and vivid as I guess what your brain pictures and some of the descriptions in the book. Uh, but it does a pretty good job, like, uh, it's, it's adequately harrowing and uncomfortable and, yeah, even though I think the fact that you're watching a live play, you know it's not real, um, more so than a movie as well, uh, it works, uh, it's, it's well done and I think also some of the harrowing cries from the performers 
at a level that maybe your brain can't if you're not a super experienced uh, reader. Uh, similar to the Harry Potter argument I made before, the performances here in this American filmed version of the play are going to solidify themselves in my brain any time I reread this book. I listened to a few chapters on the car home while running errands uh, in preparation for this video. And I was picturing the guy that played Jude whenever Jude was a subject. I pictured the I pictured the actor that played JB whenever I listened about JB. I think it was an incredibly good performance. I think JB, the actor there, knocked it out of the park. And I also think there are great things that are added in this visual version that I think will inform the book moving forward. I think Hanya Yanigahara was actually involved in the scripting and overseeing how this was handled, and it shows. There's a section in the book where JB essentially gets really resentful and starts mocking Jude and, and gets really angry at how much attention the friendship gives to him due to his trauma and disabilities. He essentially mocks Jude's disability in a really insulting caricature, similar to what Trump did about that disabled man that time. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. The way this is shot here, uh, this, this camera angle completely drops to the floor looking up at JB and it, it frames JB as almost a supervillain in this point. I heard someone in the audience audibly gasp, which is one of the only times I heard any kind of crowd interaction while seeing this movie. Um, and that was incredibly fascinating because it shows just how good this performance was. Uh, so JB, Jude, knocked it out of the park. I also thought Harold, uh, as a performer, was an incredible highlight. He spoke with such conviction. The biggest thing students struggled with, though, was the difference between the law and justice. Or more simply and profoundly, the difference between law and fairness. There is always a student who says, but that isn't fair, but not you. He's playing an experienced lawyer and teacher and there is an argument that Harold and Jude have that was incredibly well written in the book, but god damn it was incredibly well performed here where Harold is basically objecting to Jude participating in a part of the law that he doesn't approve of. It feels Shakespearean, it's, it's the closest performance I've seen to like succession level performances in like a while. Look, this movie adaptation has my seal of approval. Now yes, there are things that are missed. There are sections that are missed, but there are also sections I'm really grateful they included. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the book, maybe my favorite part of the book, is this section where Harold talks about the loss of his first child. He talks about the idea of when you first have a child, they are yours to take care of. You constantly live in fear that the worst thing will happen. Now you have love, you have joy, but you also worry that one day something awful will happen. One day you may lose your child. And then basically I'm paraphrasing and it's way more effective if you hear the whole thing, but he talks about then the idea that uh, when you lose a child, you experience all the other emotions, the pain and the grief and just the complete amount of despair. However, there's also a part of you that feels relieved because now the worst thing has happened. This is a section that resonated with me and yeah I know it's a really messed up idea to engage in but it's coming from a character who is incredibly sweet and incredibly pained and incredibly kind of compassionate to everyone around him so hearing someone this sweet in such a bleak book say something like this it gives you some pause Look, not to get too like personal and heavy but I remember this was a feeling I had when like I lost my father it's an awful idea to reckon with especially in my case due to the fact that my dad was going through cancer but I remember there was this feeling for a long time while he was going through it while he was going through chemo where I was like eventually it's coming eventually it's it's going to happen. I remember in his last kind of few weeks almost sitting there just waiting for it to happen so that part of my own personal journey can can start. Not that I was looking forward to that at all and not that I was joyful about that but almost just this feeling of it's here, it's come, it's arrived. That's what Harold talks about. He talks about the fact that finally one day you hear your child's past and then that moment has arrived, it's here. And you've been scared of it, but now it's here and now you need to move. I think it's incredibly striking and incredibly well written. And I think the people that really want to lambast this book, ban it, have these visceral, visceral reactions to the book, um, forget about sections like this. It was also fun seeing the movie in reference to what I was talking about before, this this idea of shared pain, shared suffering, the fact that you're 
watching this movie with a theater, uh, there was an intermission and I talked to about three different people about what they thought and everyone had incredibly different reactions. There were about six or seven women that left at the midway point and then they start having a discussion that we could hear in the foyer about how much they objected, the material they were watching. There were also like three or four dudes that left at the Caleb section and then another few people that left in the Dr. Trailer section. And I guess it was just incredibly fascinating to watch what resonated and hurt people and push people's buttons. I, I think both experiences are great. However, I will say, I wonder if the reason I kept up with the play as much as I did is because I'd read the book. I wonder how well it would have been communicated if I hadn't read the book. I, I so want to know what it was like for some of the people in my theater who just saw the poster and went, oh, that looks life affirming. I'll go see that. And then they're sitting there going, oh my God, it's just abuse, abuse, abuse. And where's this going? And I don't know what's going on. And who's this person? Why do they all look the same? I wonder how they would have gone, I guess, not knowing where this play was going, what's it about? And also just already being familiar with these characters because it probably is a lot to all take in at once. On top of that, one thing I want to mention that I think was a great choice in the play is that every single abuser of Jude is played by the same dude. Uh, first off, great performance from the person that plays Brother Luke, Dr. Trailer, and Caleb. Like, great performance. But wow, what an inspired choice. Like, yes, the obvious metaphor is when you are abused, there is a tendency to then see that gender or see that specific type of person as all the same. This was an idea that was explored in the film Men. I guess also just the idea of an embodiment of trauma, right? The idea that this afflicted male sexually based violence comes up in the same form with different outfits at different phases of Jude's life. It's fantastic. And on on top of that, it's 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 also a great visual metaphor for that idea of people that are abused once or experienced abusive relationships once almost subconsciously then find and gravitate to situations where they are exposed to that again. You know, it's a very well considered fact that a lot of people that are in abusive relationships once will have more and there are some people that just never have to endure that and yeah i think the choice here to have it played by the same person was incredibly interesting the lightning round begins stop it <laughs> now so moving on from the book and movie now we're going to have like a rapid fire section uh internet reactions you can hide behind these keyboards but you wouldn't say it to my face I just want to say I'm embarrassed by my generation and younger by some of the reactions they have had to this book. You can think that this book failed in its execution. You can think that this was overrated. You can think that some of its subject matter was poorly explored. There is a lot to be said about how certain subject matters are handled here, but the idea that this book should be banned, that this book shouldn't exist, or that this book is purely exploitative or purely voyeuristic. Now, yes, are there parts to me that feel exploitative and voyeuristic? Absolutely. But I cannot sit here in good conscience and tell you that there is nothing to be gained from this book. The use of language is incredible. That section I talked about with Harold, talking about the loss of a child is equally beautiful and haunting. There are also great sections with Willem and Jude that are exploring trying to make something work with someone who has experienced a severe amount of trauma. And I think it can lead to really interesting discussions. There is so much that this book has to offer in certain sections at the very least. The hailing it as a complete write-off is absurd. The the cover alone, the use of the title in different sections, uh, it's great. There's this one video of this girl reading the saddest books of all time as like a trend uh, where she's like crying into the camera and saying, why would someone write this? And it's like, if you can't find anything to like, uh, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe, maybe book content isn't for you. On top of that, I also saw another hilarious TikTok where someone was like, uh, the only thing you can get from this book is depression. Because this book will give you nothing but sadness, depression, and mental illness. And then they also said in the same video, the only thing I can say about this book is that it's incredibly well written. The only good thing that I'll say about this book is that it's really well written. Aside from that, it's a total piece of shit. That's it. That is like saying the only thing I can say about this restaurant is that the food is good. Or the only thing I can say about the movie is that it was fun to watch. Like, what are you talking about? The only thing you can say about this book is it's well written. Like, I, I guess the argument they could be making is that it uses the English language well and uh, it reads well. 
maybe in order for something to be well written at least in my opinion it at least has to have a story that you find interesting or compelling and i think what happens is the book gets so dark and so heavy deals with people that are so morally reprehensible that you almost want to come out and be like this is bad this is bad everyone know that i think this is bad and to me, it just reeks of guilt for maybe enjoying the book and being compelled by it. What, it. what does it say about us as an audience that we want to engage in 32 hours of audio about this subject matter? Now, I'm someone who's willing to sit in the pocket here and examine myself and go, Oi, maybe I do have a weird tendency to enjoy really dark art. Does that say anything about me? But I think there's just a divide that's happening with my generation and younger where the idea that you can get some joy and some weird sense of catharsis from engaging in this sort of media is troubling and challenging. It feels like some of the reaction that these internet creators are having almost feels like I just want everyone on the internet to know that I do not approve of some of the characters in this book. And it's like, yeah, like enjoying something does not mean you condone certain things and that's okay on the other hand there are some great great videos that i want to shout out about this book one positive one i think there's a, a video called 14 things to think about after reading a little life uh, that video is great i also think the video from man carrying a thing which more serves as a critique of the book is also fantastic um so watch both of those as well as this video critique a lot of its elements i didn't agree with everything here but the parts that i did agree with I found incredibly compelling, and the parts I didn't agree with, I still found interesting. Well, I mean, I, I did not cry, um, and I, I, in fact, my first reader didn't cry at all, and my agent didn't cry, and my editor didn't cry. So when people started crying, I thought, wow, what a bunch of pussies, you know? But. Um, I think in terms of being interviewed, Hanya Yanigahara is just unbelievable. I have read a few interviews and watched a few interviews of her. She is just saying shit with no filter. She does not care. Um, even knowing how controversial this book has been, she just she just goes, well, it's a bestseller. I wrote what I wanted to write and you guys need to deal with it. She just does not hold back. The, people will phrase questions to her in a very delicate way and she just goes, nah. I have to say, I do respect it. Now, whether you agree with a lot of what she said or not, and you can disagree because there are some uh, there are some bold ideas she presents in her interviews, which we will get into. I admire her ability to stick by her art and stick by her beliefs and stick by her words. She has a very take it or leave it approach. Uh, Hanya just constantly doubles down on the parts that are considered problematic and just goes, no, this is the story I was looking to tell. Like, this is exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to do this, this and this. Now, look, there are also parts that come from Hanya Yanigahara that make the book worse. In terms of whether this book is just torture or exploitative or almost hyperbolic, given some of her interview statements, I can't help but feel that. Now, one thing that came up in this interview is the fact that she actually thought about the front cover just being a bag of Jude's razor blades. All he has standing between him and the world is that bag of razors. And I thought I actually wanted that to be the cover, but they said no. But there was... There, but, but that feels edgelord, that feels lazy, and it almost spits in the face of how much I like the Orgasmic Man front cover, uh, because I feel that is an incredibly profound and interesting idea for a book cover. But then I guess this idea of it being uh, razor blades just feels incredibly juvenile, incredibly edgy. It just feels like that emo Tumblr art I used to see where it's like, I'm fine, help me. Isn't it cool to be emo? And it's like the book is so mature at points, so well written and so like harrowing. I, I just feel like the cover being a bag of razor blades feels so overly simplistic and yeah, just like lame edgelord. And she laughs as she says it. She has various points in her interviews where she laughs at things that I feel like I've given her a lot of credit for. And I'm like, oh, well, should I be giving you this credit or are you a bit juvenile? I initially, when I read the book, I pushed back on a lot of the ideas that this was a lazy book or this was an exploitative book. I thought this was a book full of great moments of humanity and beauty. But then hearing some parts of her interview, I'm like, is she, is she just having fun torturing these characters? Like, is that what she's doing? Um, because yeah, like there are just a few points where she laughs at things where I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like I woke up one day and wanted to write a book about child 
and then like laughs in the same breath and like none of the audience is laughing and i look i respect it i i respect her commitment to like and look i respect as i said i respect her commitment to like her authentic self but i guess it's this thing of there are some parts of her interview that makes me respect the book and like the book a lot more and a lot of other stuff that she says where i'm like i think you've made the book a bit worse i wish i didn't know that so we're going to get into that now so yeah, as I said, the idea that she wanted to explore a character that doesn't get better, whether there is narrative tension created in that, incredibly, incredibly fascinating. Uh, next, uh, she has this incredibly profound point in one of her interviews at the 20 minute mark, I'll play a clip, where she talks about uh, basically this idea that people have a linear idea of trauma, like the trauma happens and then you process it and then you move on with your life. And she has this idea that it isn't past or present and it's it's kind of in the next room waiting for you. I think for some people, there is a line, there is an amount and they're not able to come back from it. And one of the things I tried to do in this book was really glide a lot between past and present tense. This idea that if you're living with trauma, trauma is not something that happened in the past and then there's a hard defining line into the present. Trauma is something that's waiting in the next room, you know, behind that curtain right next to you. Um, and also that is greatly, greatly uh, sort of visually and metaphorically explored with uh, brother Luke. That's a really fascinating idea and I commend her for talking about this in such an open way. And I found a lot of her interviews to be incredibly cathartic for a lot of stuff I've dealt with growing up too. Uh, she also goes on to talk about how trauma starts to contextualize when you get older. She said that what she was looking to explore with Jude is the idea that there are some traumas that start at a certain point and actually as you get older and you start to contextualize who you are, where you belong in the world and how you see things, you start to realize just how bad certain things were. There are things you tolerated and then as you don't tolerate them or as you get older or you understand how people should be treated, they get worse. And obviously that is really well explored with Jude because because Jude is basically abused from a very, very young age and things that should never be normal are normalized to him. So it takes him a long time for the full effects of his trauma to come in. A great moment of the author and the text having a high amount of interconnectivity. But then there's a really striking point I found. Now, look, there is a big debate to be had on what you should and shouldn't research when writing a book. I, I think it just helps your case if you write a book and you say that you research the subject matter, particularly if the subject matter is abuse in sort of any form or the subject matter is ableism and what it's like to live with a disability. And it's really interesting because Hanya sort of brags and talks about in an interview how much fun she had basically researching uh, what it's like to be a lawyer, what it's like to be a chef, what it's like to be an architect, what it's like to be an actor. She basically talked about how she gets to call up her friends and hear them talk to inform these characters and how much fun that part of writing a book is. Unheralded um, privileges of, of writing fiction is it gives you strange permission to call up anyone and say, I'd like to talk to you about your job. And they will. And it's really, they really will. And people are, are wonderful talking about, you know, I really hate doing research, but this is, was, it was a really great sort of two intense months of talking to people about what they did every day. Um, uh, but then in the same breath, she goes on to say that in terms of the child, as well as other subjects, she did like no research. In terms of the Australia, I didn't do any research and you sort of don't have to. And it's like, if she didn't research anything, that'd be one thing. Kind of talks about how much fun she had researching the fun stuff. And then when it comes to the dark stuff, uh, she just went, fuck that, I'm the expert here and cool. Now, I don't think it means she's a bad person or she should be canceled. And I think there are a lot of parts for someone that didn't research this stuff were incredibly well realized. And also on top of that, I got the vibe throughout the interview that she herself has probably been through some stuff growing up. Um, I can't say it's the exact stuff that's in the book, but she constantly talks about her own trauma, dealing with her own life as a woman. And I can't help but sort of read between the lines and gather that maybe she's drawing on her own beliefs own experiences and own thoughts. I'll cut her some level of slack there, but it almost makes me think, is the fact that she may or may not have relate to something she's exploring in the trauma side of the book, does she just feel like then she doesn't need to actually research it? Um, but when it comes to the other stuff, like the law degree, she feels like she does need to research it. Don't hurt the face, I'm an actor. Hanya also had some really, really interesting things to say about Willem. Now, the audience reception of Willem I find incredibly, incredibly interesting because some people think he's a really caring and compassionate 
partner who's really trying to make a relationship with Jude work, but also have his needs fulfilled. Where on the other hand, I've seen some people say that basically given who Jude is, what he's signed up for, um, and the, the, the pressure that clearly comes from having a sexual and romantic relationship, Willem should know better. And I guess I, I found both ends of the discourse interesting because I remember thinking for a lot of the book that Willem handled himself really well. But then when I watched the movie and I saw Willem cut himself in response to Jude cutting, as well as sort of some of the sexual pressure in both the book and the movie, I did feel like Willem slipped here and there. Now, obviously we're all human and we can have moments where we slip, but I, I guess my read on Willem was a bit more complicated. I don't see him purely as a savior in Jude's life, especially given how Jude talks about Willem. I guess what I found interesting here was the fact that Hanya actually was concerned that Willem came off as too much of a saint. Um, but I wanted Willem to be, you know, I went back and forth with my editor and with my reader about this. You know, was Willem too saint-like? And I guess more interestingly is, I remember I had this question in the book, like what does Willem get out of a romantic relationship with Jude that he doesn't get out of just a strictly friendly one where they may have just been roommates? Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to gather because not only is he not getting physical intimacy, but Jude is completely emotionally broken, uh, wallowing a lot of the time. I'm not trying to judge Jude for this, uh, totally fair enough. But I guess just on a very selfish level for Willem, I'm wondering what was drawn to him. And this was a question that was actually asked by an audience member in this interview. And Hanya really explained it well, where she just said, sometimes you're just drawn to someone. And she was like, you know, there are people that you have in your life that you know maybe aren't good for you, or you don't always enjoy their company but you have that soft spot for them. You have that really warm relationship about them. I also loved what she said about their relationship. And it brings me to another point about this being hailed as the great gay novel. Absurd fucking statement, absurd statement. And we'll get into that. Uh, she talks about Willem and Drew's relationship and she says, I don't really see it as a gay relationship. She talks about the fact that Often with women, they can have a sort of sexual component with some of their female friends here or there. They're not instantly labeled as a lesbian. They can flow in and out of these sort of relationships where the intimacy level is incredibly high. Um, but with men, it often feels like they're instantly labeled as gay. And she talks about the fact that she didn't want to be seen as a gay relationship. She just wanted to be seen as sort of a relationship. When I was in the third grade, I thought that I was gay. And that's the thing, I think this book being labeled as the great gay novel, absurd fucking statement, pigeonholes it in a really unfortunate way. First off, if this is the great gay novel, I, I feel bad for the gays. This is a harrowing, painful, and very much like punish your gay story. Uh, every single man in this pretty much is a opportunistic homosexual predator. Number two, what you're saying is the first 18 people to have discovered him in this state just happen to be opportunistic homosexual Looks like it. Like, there's, there, there's no other way to go about it, minus Willem, and even he can feel coercive at different points in the book. But that's not what I asked. Uh, I'm really tired, Willem. I'm actually gonna no, go to bed. Dude, don't! Don't walk away from me! I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about something important here. No, you're right. You're right, Willem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, it's, it's too difficult for me to discuss right Everything now. Everything is too difficult for you to discuss! This is just a book that is exploring male on male violence consistently. The idea that some LGBTQ youth are gonna search up um, uh, good gay novels and this is gonna be hailed at the top as the great gay novel is an absurd idea. Um, and yeah, look, I'm sure there are people from that community that enjoy the book, but it is just like, no. Um, first off, the author has flat out said that Willem and Jude are really a gay couple and the emphasis is more on just like the loving the person nature of it. You know, wanted him to be a character who really loves Jude and really um, offers a different sort of way of, of for Jude to see himself, even though Jude can never quite see it. But I also wanted to create a relationship that wasn't quite a French, a straight friendship in all senses of the word and wasn't quite a romance either. A friend of mine, she recently asked me if you were gay or straight and, and i had to tell her i didn't know maybe you're both maybe you're neither hey it doesn't make a difference to me jude do you want to be with someone no no it's not for someone like me but i also think the book isn't really interested in exploring lgbtq issues at all it really doesn't spend a lot of time exploring lgbtq issues there are just interactions where you go oh that's interesting due to their sexuality the main one for me that stuck out was when jb was really jealous of jude's good looks and felt like jude's good looks were wasted on someone who basically didn't use them due to his 
uh, sexual trauma. That's a really interesting idea, and I also feel like a lot of JB's conflicts with Jude and with Willem feel like potentially projection coming from a maybe homoerotic romantic place. He says this outwardly at certain points. When Willem starts dating Jude, JB says, oh, I always thought you had the hots for me. Um, I'm kind of jealous. And so I guess that's a really interesting idea, like the idea that we're searching stories about friendships and you see how the romantic natures kind of uh, get in the way of a functional friendship group. When Jude and Willem discuss their sexuality, it's very much to sort of just get to their own relationship. And their, their relationship is one that is filled with a lot of pain and cut very prematurely short. So yeah, the idea that this is a great gay novel is absurd. But I did find Hanya's sort of reading of their relationship not being a gay relationship and just being a relationship interesting. She was more so seen out to explore just the bond between men. I also find it interesting, she's talked about the fact that she particularly wanted to write a story about men. And she feels like men often, unless they're in the company of female friends, don't have the ability to talk about their emotions. And she wanted to write a book that was doing that. And I find that as a man, I find that a noble pursuit. Um, oftentimes there is a big discussion about male authors writing for women. Um, and that often goes in the way of, well, they shouldn't be doing it. And I guess now is my chance to speak as a guy having a book that is talking about not only like male experiences, but like this kind of level of male experiences. I don't think she's too out of pocket. I almost feel a bit validated by some of what she's written and some of what she said. I, her kind of acknowledging some of the pain and difficulty that people find talking about these subject matters is admirable. And I admire her pursuit to do that. However, I also don't like on a personal level feeding into the notion that men can't and don't talk about their feelings. I think as we're getting younger, it is becoming more and more common. And I feel like instilling the idea in men very often that uh, it's something we don't do or something that society shuns us for almost creates a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. Now, this isn't a criticism I'm levying at her. It's more so about the general discussion. I often find at times men have this awful tendency to discount other people's issues and go, yeah, well, we have issues too because we can't talk about our feelings. And I'm like, okay, like that almost sounds like a you thing sometimes. <sighs> What a bunch of pussies, you know? Uh, next, I, I, I found it really interesting that Hanya talked about the fact that she didn't ever cry writing the book. Her editor didn't cry. No one she showed the book cried. I, I did not cry. Um, and I, I, in fact, my first reader didn't cry at all. And my agent didn't cry. And my editor didn't cry. Um, and it's interesting, I guess, just because people my generation are doing like try not to cry challenges. She, she had this jokey response that when someone cried, she went, oh, pussies. So when people started crying, I thought, wow, what a bunch of pussies, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, that shows the hardcore woman we are dealing with who wrote this book. She is, she has a mean streak, all right? And that's fine. But the idea that she's gonna describe people that, that cried at her book as pussy, it, it, it does kind of suggest that there is a mean streak here and there in the book. Um, and I think it means that you can look at this book more critically and more objectively rather than going, oh, this definitely has its heart in the right place. It might not, depending on what your moral values are. Okay. That kind of brings me to the big controversy that uh, Hanya Yanigahara had, which is when she talked about the ethics of therapy. To me, knowing this quote and knowing how she feels makes some parts of the book more interesting and really tarnishes some of the book. So I just want to get into this quote quickly. While I'm here in this interview, she also talks about that idea of like male emotions. Quote, there's no society that I know of that encourages men to put words to the sort of feelings, much less encourages their expressions of those feelings that women get to take for granted. Maybe this is changing with the younger men, but I sometimes listen to my male friends talk and can understand that what they're trying to communicate is fear or shame or vulnerability. She basically then finishes this quote saying that men talk about their emotions in contours, but not in depth. I find this interesting because I talk about my emotions in depth uh, often. I have to agree with her. A lot of men I've known, a lot of my older male figures did talk this way. And a lot of guys I know my age now 
also talk to this way. A, a, a lot, a lot of it is, it is what it is. I don't know. And like, you, you'll kind of like hear some quotes thrown out where you're like, oh, I, I, I think there's a core emotion here that's worth talking about and it'll get shut down. I also appreciate her comments on trigger warnings. Basically, the interviewer says, those in favor of trigger warnings would argue that those who have been victims of trauma have the right to opt out of an experience that would further traumatize them. What would you say to a student who want to exercise their right to opt out of experiencing your book if it was assigned in a class? She says, to try to preemptively shield yourself from an experience to say, in essence, this book is about something that I fear and it's going to really upset me, so I better protect myself by not exposing myself to it at all, is not only limiting, but also means you might be preventing yourself from experiencing something else, something you thought you never would or never have. It also reduces art to a single topic and to a single reaction. I would hate if this book was dismissed as a book about abuse. I find this quote interesting because I actually agree with that first part there. I agree that like, yeah, if you just opt out of everything because it sounds too sensitive, you'll probably miss out on a lot. However, I do think Hanya's book is going to be defined by abuse. It is about abuse. It's about the effects of abuse. Yeah, it's about some other things, but uh, the amount of abuse she puts in this book, it is, it is it is going to be incredibly hard for this book to not be defined by its abusive content. Ultimately, while there are some great, beautiful moments, I think it is a book that's always going to be defined by that. Um, there's also a part that brings me back to what I was talking about with Hanya before, where she can just be very blunt, very cold, and also that choice she made to not research. The interview goes, having known several women who have suffered abuse, Jude's psychology of self-loathing, shame, and tendency to blame himself for the abuse he suffered struck me as one of the most accurate portrayals of the mindset of an abused person I've ever read. Did you do any research to build this character? Was it difficult to write this material? And Hanya goes, no, I didn't do any research. Jude came to me fully formed, and writing his sections were always the easiest. Um... The big one I want to talk about here in my closing sort of section is going to be about Hanya's thoughts on therapy. The interviewer asks, The way you reveal Jude's childhood is relentless and seems to mirror Jude's inability to forget what happened to him. Despite the immense success he achieves in his life, in this way you resist the comfortable narrative arc of abuse followed by healing. Jude resists therapy, to the frustration of his friends and family, and this reader. And one of the main questions the book seems to address is whether talk therapy works. What do you think the limits of therapy are? And Hanya just basically goes on to say that she does not agree with therapy and just say some wild shit. So here we go. She goes, As for the limits of therapy, I can't speak to them. Only that therapy, like any medical treatment, is finite in its ability to save and correct. I think of psychology the way I think of religion, a school of belief or thought that offers many, many people's solace and answers, an invention that defines the way we view our fellow man and how we create social interest and how we create social infrastructure, one that has inspired some of our greatest works of art and philosophy. So, so far, maybe a bit controversial, I sort of agree, all right? The idea that therapy is limited and it's also limited by how much the person itself wants to get better is a cool idea and I agree it's not an answer for everyone. That's fine. Um, but she goes on to say, but I don't believe in it, talk therapy, I should specify, myself. One of the things that makes me most suspicious about the field is its insistence that life is always the answer. Which is just a, a wild thing to say because what it's inferring is just nuts. And then she goes, every other medical specialty devoted to the care of the seriously ill recognizes that at some point, the doctor's job is to help the patient die. That there are points at which death is preferable to life. And the interviewer goes on to say this, it almost sounds like she's saying that she, she wants therapists to acknowledge themselves that their clients are maybe just better off taking the uh, most nuclear option when it comes to dealing with mental health. And yeah, it's just wild. Look, there's some things to unpack. There's very specific circumstances you can maybe come up with where she has maybe some merit, slightly, but for the most part, this is just a wild, wild thing to say, especially on a public forum. And I guess the thing is, as a result, knowing this quote, reading the book, but keeping in mind that she thinks a fundamental flaw of therapy is its insistence of the patient choosing life rather than certain people just, uh, is wild. It does add a sort of cynical nature to a book that initially I gave a lot of charity to going into it. Um, a book that I found moving and beautiful at points and harrowing and cathartic and honestly like entertaining and boundary pushing 
and utterly captivating and completely consumptive. I, I, I was obsessed with this book, but rereading it, knowing that that is her sort of quote, and it almost feels like she wrote this character of Jude and wrote this book in sort of this maniacal puppeteering way to kind of go, see, told you so. Look, there are some people that can't be cured. You think you think he wants to stay living? Who would want to live like that? Um, does feel really juvenile especially yeah with the like whole like razors on the front cover thing it, it feels like a really juvenile way to write a story and i don't know if the whole time she's writing the story she's like this is going to prove my thoughts on therapy i feel like she's allowed to write and explore whatever she wants to and i don't think the book's issue is the subject matter i guess just knowing what she thinks of therapy it does feel like yeah reading the book it almost feels like she she's creating like a 800 page straw man argument you know what i mean like you know when people throw hypotheticals at you in arguments it's like but that that hasn't happened you know the whole like well what if this and it's like but we're not talking about what ifs and i feel like here with a little life it almost feels like she's written a book to just be able to point to people when they disagree with her the insistence of life in therapy is a problem to go oh well what about jude you, keep, you think keeping jude's mental turmoil going any longer you think he could have achieved anything more like blah 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 you know it, it just feels like she wants a character that she can point to and say what else did he have to gain um of course he should have died and and therapy keeping him or trying to keep him alive any longer is absurd and it's like even if that's an airtight argument in Jude's case, it's like you had to create a character with a life that is so absurdly, absurdly over the top with so much ridiculous trauma, one thing after the other. Like a few of these things you'd be like, sure, but just a obscene, ridiculous, uh, fanciful amount to justify your thoughts on therapy feels a bit weird. On top of that, she has then described this book as a dark fairy tale. She says it's meant to be viewed as a fable, a fairy tale in certain points. You're meant to sort of go with how absurd some of it is. And it's like, well, in that case, it's like, it, it, it feels weird that this book is being paired with her comments. It depends on how much you believe in death of the author, but I find as a result, whenever I, I find as a result, when I engage with the movie and my reread of the book, this quote of hers was in the back of my head and I was thinking, is is this all just a ploy for me to go, yeah, you're right, Hanya, some people should take that option and, and therapy is a bit silly for people like this. It's a weird thing to want to achieve and I feel like that is partially her goal. All these things aside, I think this book is just infinitely, infinitely fascinating. I think this discourse is incredibly, incredibly fascinating and I just think it's a total waste to not read this book due to its subject matter. The rest of this stuff, the rest of these controversies that come from the author, um, it's sort of like how much you engage with it will inform how much it ruins the book for you. But I, I just can't stop thinking about this book. I can't stop thinking about this movie. I can't stop thinking about the author and her interviews. I find her interviews incredibly fascinating. Whether I disagree or agree with whatever she's saying, I think it is one of the most interesting creator interviews I've ever seen. The level of additional information and thoughts I got directly from the author were incredibly fascinating. So I implore you, if you've read the book, to watch the full interview with her uh, talking about how she views Willem and Jude and JB. It, it just adds so much more substance and so much interesting insight into these characters and into a book that I feel like has been mischaracterized, misjudged and pigeonholed. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you got something out of this. Let me know what you'd like me to talk about next. Uh, have a lovely day.